You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Episode 15. Derek and Beverly Joubert are award-winning filmmakers, National Geographic explorers in residence, and wildlife conservationists who have been filming, researching, and exploring in Africa for over 30 years. Their mission is the conservation and understanding of large predators and other key wildlife species that determine the course of all conservation in Africa. They are the founders of the Big Cats Initiative with National Geographic, which currently funds 80 grants in 27 countries for the conservation of big cats. The Joubert's have made over 25 films for National Geographic, published 11 books, half a dozen scientific papers, and have written many articles for the National Geographic magazine. Beverly Joubert is also an acclaimed photographer, and her international exhibitions have further helped raise awareness for the plight of big cats across the world. Their films have received international recognition with major accolades, including eight Emmys, a Peabody, a Wild Screen Panda Award, and also a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Japan Wildlife Film Festival, to name but a few. The Joubert's were also awarded the World Ecology Award alongside Prince Charles and Richard Leakey, and in 2009 they were inducted into the American Academy of Achievement with the likes of the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In 2013, the Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival awarded Derek and Beverly with the Outstanding Achievement Award. In 2011, Derek and Beverly were honoured with the Presidential Order of Meritorious Service by the President of Botswana for their work within the country. And in 2014, Derek and Beverly won the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the SAFTAs. In recent years, the Joubert's have expanded their conservation outreach through another business venture, Great Plains Conservation. Derek is CEO of the company, and together with their business partners, they've found a way to bring together conservation, communities, and conservation tourism to fund large tracts of land that can be protected for local wildlife and the surrounding communities. Today, that land totals about 1 million acres in Africa. All of Derek and Beverly's work coincides with one aim, to save the wild places of Africa and to protect the creatures that depend on them. The president of Botswana described them well when he said, theirs is a lifelong passion for each other, for big cats, for Africa. They are true children of Africa. Thank you, Derek and Beverly, for taking the time out. I know your schedule here at the Jackson Hole uh, Film Festival is is very, very busy. So thanks for taking the time out, first of all. Um, being on this podcast is all about inspiring filmmakers, and you guys are icons in the natural history filmmaking world. So it's a true honor to have you on the show. I'd like just to start by asking you about how you got into wildlife filmmaking. What was it that drove you into this field? Well, really for, for both of us, I think it was coming from a, a conservation background and um, studying lions and studying the Africa and really trying to peel back the layers of Africa. Um, and then we found some cameras, we picked up those cameras and we used cameras as a communi communication medium to the rest of the world. And we were finding that, you know, I'd written a scientific paper that, that reached 12 other people and uh, taken some tourists around, and that was maybe 100 people. But uh, one of our early films, Eternal Enemies, was seen by a billion people. So the, the, the power of that voice is quite significant. Yeah, that's incredible to have that reach with film. Absolutely. Um, just to add to Derek's answer is um, I believe Derek and I were born to be explorers and so that also helped. You know, we wanted to explore. We wanted to explore the true Africa, the real Africa, the iconic Africa. And um, and I, I think um, doing that we also became, uh, you know, we romanticized what we were seeing until we saw the devastation which didn't take long and that's when we knew we had to make a difference. And so each and every film of ours um, has that very very strong conservation message not that um, you know that many blue chip films but at the same time we still weave the conservation uh, the conservation message um, through each and every one of them and I think that's important I think for the future of any filmmaker have a purpose it's not just about you want to be a filmmaker and go out there have a purpose that you are going to be able to change the world the world needs the global um, wilderness needs every single one of us right now 
And I think that's what's so incredible about your films is it, there is a conservation message. And I think we lose that in so much TV these days because so many of the networks are scared of going down that road. Um, and I, your movies stand out because of that. And, you know, it shows that you're there to be doing more than just making entertainment. Right, exactly. The entire purpose of our being is to talk about conservation. So Beverly and I wake up in the morning and, and, and think about how we can change the world and how we can bring the conservation message through. So film is one way, and we do that a lot, but we do it in all sorts of other forms of, of our daily life anyway. So we get involved in rolling up our sleeves in big conservation moves, like we're moving 100 rhinos out of South Africa into Botswana. Physically, there may or may not be a film associated with that. Uh, we started the Big Cats Initiative to save big cats. And again, I don't think we've done a film specifically about the Big Cats Initiative. So it is just one more weapon for us, uh, this filmmaking, but it's all about conservation. And each film needs to be shown to the governments of the country because we have seen through our 30 odd years of, of um, making films in Botswana and a little in Kenya uh, that you can make a difference. You can actually help influence the change in the country. I don't believe that um, that we will be able to change policy, but you can at least give the policy makers um, a better education on what's happening in their country, and then they can make the right um, decisions. And just to give you an example, we. Um, we made a film called Patterns in the Grass, and they were going to put up all these fences that were going to block the migration. Well, they straight away stopped that, but they also stopped, uh, they would give open season to hunt zebra so that they could sell the skins. They straight away stopped that because in our film it showed that the migration went from 45,000 down to 7,000. So you can have an impact, and that's why I say you have to have a social consciousness to, um, to make a difference in every single form that we make. Well, and I think this shows that the passion you guys have with conservation obviously comes through in your work, but also the impact that you've made and the changes you've made, probably more than any other filmmaker I know, um, on a real kind of on the ground action that's taken place as you've just explained, which is it's so incredible. Um, you guys work incredibly well together. Can you tell me a little bit about, were, were you guys together when you got into film? Did you meet uh, after you were filmmakers, how did how did that come about? So yeah, we met in high school actually. So it's before we knew what we were going to do, and before we'd even formulated our brains and our consciousness. Um, so no, we met in high school and through college, university, and then finally um, in our early twenties, went out into the into the wild and together to explore, to to have fun, and then stumbled into into the need to have a voice for conservation. Um, and so that's how it worked. And, and then we, were, we tried to define different roles for ourselves because we had seen so many people in love, as we are, um, uh, struggling over their careers. So if you go to work in the morning, you start at 7 and you come back at 7, uh, you've spent the best part of your day with somebody else, a whole lot of other people. And so we actually strategically designed a lifestyle that would put us together as much time as possible through the day. I don't know why you would ever, you know, fall in love with somebody and then spend as much time as possible away from them. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. My wife and I are exactly the same. We try and do everything together. And um, I think that's so unbelievably important. I think that's why this industry has so many couple filmmakers. You know, they, they're helping each other out day to day and really making very good films because they get on so well and, and they have a passion together to do their work, which is um, amazing. Now, you guys live in a, what, what would you call your house? Is it a tent house? I, I don't know how, what, what, what's it called? Absolutely. It, it, it is a tent, a canvas tent. So we really live under the stars and we've got the canvas, you, you know, covering us. In fact, um, sh we shower under the stars. Uh, we cook um, under the stars at nighttime. Um, everything happens in this little t um, camp. But there have been times where we do nocturnal work, and so then we live under our, you know, out of our vehicle, um, 
and that is, you know, you go right through the night, you follow your animal. And that's how we started in the early, early days. We brought out a film called Eternal Enemies, which actually gave us a little recognition. And, um, and then from there, you know, we um, joined up with uh, the National Geographic and mainly made all our films for them for, you know, many years. But it is important to be able to be comfortable in nature, living um, out in the wild, because it's not all that romantic at all. There's a lot of it that is intense heat. We have heat right now in Botswana that's 43 degrees Celsius. And the mosquitoes, um, you know, uh, well, <laughs> a major incident that's just happened to us right now. Um, and yet it was a freak accident. It was at nighttime just going from our one tent to the other. Uh, we were both hit by a buffalo bull. And so you have to know that um, you have to be alert, prepared, and at all times um, know that you are going to be vulnerable but not live in fear. Because I think if you live in fear, uh, you're not going to be effective in what you're there to capture and to be able to give that same passion you're feeling into the film. Well, absolutely. And, and we've always felt that uh, we, we're incapable of, of phoning it in. So, so we need to live there. We need to be with those lions or the leopard or whatever else we're following and put ourselves into into their lives so that we understand what they are and only by doing the time really well a we get the the exposure or the chances of getting something unusual but also understanding those animals so that we can tell their stories a large portion of what we do is is really take on ambassadorial roles for these animals that comes back to the conservation but but, you know, there's so many of these animals that are just being persecuted right now, and, and we're the voice of, of protest for them. Can you name a few of the uh, conservation foundations you've set up? Because I know you've got Rhinos Without Borders, yeah. um, and, and name some of the others. There's more than one. Well, we sit on the board of the Big Life uh, Foundation, Rhinos Without Borders, the Great Plains Foundation, which is uh, our, our personal foundation, really. Um, we're on... Um, What's it? Uh, Wild Aid. Wild Aid. Um, yeah. Um, we're on the Wildlife Conservation Trust in India. Um, anything that that's doing proactive conservation work is of interest to us. Um, we, uh, when we started the Big Cats Initiative, for example, at National Geographic, the mandate that we set up was we will help fund things that are about hardcore conservation, not about lion behavior or cheetah hunting habits or anything like that. It's about how to solve these problems now. And I think it is important to say um, that we will also collaborate with a lot of the NGOs. For instance, um, the last CITES that was in Johannesburg, we collaborated with the Human Humane Society, I4, um, Born, Free. Born Free, and um, you know a few others. And I think by collaborating and not having an ego about your own brand, you can be stronger. And so there are times that we we will do that. We're actually going to be doing that now with the National Geographic Big Cat Initiative and, um, and collaborate with as many of the other NGOs as possible. But most of what we do um, when we're in Botswana and Kenya goes through our Great Plains Foundation. And then we um, allocate it where it is needed. And then anything on big cats, obviously, we go to the National Geographic Big Cat Initiative. I mean, that, that's truly tremendous, the amount of conservation work you guys are doing. And not only conservation, but your films have actually helped push science forward as well. Um, I know that you've filmed things in the wild that have never been seen before, and scientists kind of question, you know, whether this is true or not until they see the things you've filmed. Can you um, explain a bit about that? I know you've, uh, the, I think, called Super Lions, the lions that uh, you, you've filmed swimming, and also the, uh, the leopard that um, took care of a baby baboon. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about those? So each film really has, has uh, revealed something that science had not yet known or, or just starting to struggle with. So I think there are a, a range of different ways to go about a film and some people read all the science and go out and then show that in a film. We, we read all the science and then push it to one side and then go out and, and try and discover something new or certainly be open to it. So. Um, I know that Beverly was talking about the zebra migration, there was something in there. Um, the whole thing about eternal enemies is that nobody believed that these lions and hyenas were having these tremendous battles that night. Or in fact that hyenas were killing most of the prey and the lions were scavenging from them. Then later on we, um, 
we worked at these these water holes in Botswana where just for about six weeks of the year lions just then turned to elephants and they started killing elephants and these tremendous battles between these two huge huge animals in Africa were playing out in front of us and when we started talking about it scientifically everybody went that's impossible a lion would never kill an elephant well we filmed about 17 of those and and the last one that we filmed was extraordinary in that a lioness jumped out of a tree onto a 70 year old bull elephant so just the biggest of the biggest um what else was there the leopard and, and baboon oh yeah i can tell you the leopard and baboon. leopards are truly have a soft i have a soft spot for for leopards um we followed uh, this little leopard that we eventually called lachadima uh, from about um when she was eight years old and you know and went through it for three years and Leopards sort of come to maturity, I mean the textbooks they say 19, but this little leopard was quite sassy and she came into her maturity, you know, sort of 13, 14. And her mother and herself had been terrorized by baboons um, constantly, you know, in their dens, or if she was out hunting, with, with if her mother was out hunting, you know, her mother would actually run from baboons. And so what we saw surprised us when she was about 13 months old. Um, she saw an opportunity. There was a female baboon with a baby and she killed the female. None of us had seen the baby. I don't think um, uh, little Lachadima had um, nor us. And she dragged this um, baboon up a tree very quickly because there was a hyena close by. And so she got it up the tree. But as she pulled the baby up, the, I mean the, the mother up a tree, this little thing fell out of the mother's fur, landed on the ground. And I think we were spellbound. You know, we thought, okay, uh, a predator, there's prey, we know what's going to happen. But the reverse happened. The innocence of the baby baboon, just sort of not running and sort of reaching out. And like you could see, Lachadima was intrigued. She picked her up by the scruff of her neck, took her up. And then for hours, they lay together, she groomed it, they fell asleep together because it, it was really cold, uh, you know, the chill of winter. And um, it, it was just that, you know, oh my gosh, we can all live together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's incredible. You watch that piece of film and it's, you know, inspiring to see how animals, I mean, you know, predator prey, but then the interaction and, and the uh, the love, the, the kind of maternal instinct between two species is astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Well, I think, yes, it's that empathy, really. And there are so many lessons from the wild that we pull through into our lives. And we discover then that that these animals, elephants in particular, but other, other cats like leopards, have all of these things that uh, we most admire in ourselves. And they have none of the things that we dislike about our species. Now... You, you guys have seen a lot of um, prey, uh, predator prey interaction. H how do you feel about that when you're in the field? You know, because it's one of those things, it's, it can be hard to watch. I, I've seen the, the elephant with, you know, 10 lions on it. And, and what's it like? I mean, it's nature, it's happening in front of you. Is it something you get desensitized to after a while? Or, you know, what's the feeling there? Yeah, I think the danger is that you de you desensitize to it. But um, we've been very, very strict on ourselves on a number of levels here because our business for a large chunk of our careers was filming kills. So we needed to very early on set up some ethical boundaries and also some emotional boundaries. And uh, so what, like one of the rules, for instance, is that we never, never intervene. So if it's happening and it's nature and it's in front of us, we never intervene. It uh, doesn't matter whether it's a beautiful little baby elephant uh, and hyenas, which are generally thought of as not being as beautiful. Um, but the times that we do inter intervene is when it's man-made. So if it's an elephant in a snare, we won't just film it and watch it until it dies. We then try and arrange some, some veterinary services to come in and do that sort of thing. But we're also very disciplined about not, not pushing it away too far. So we've, we've seen uh, over 1,400 kills. And wow. uh, with that sort of uh, volume, you'd expect us to just chalk up another one. But each one is a celebration. Uh, not that we got it on film or missed it, but a celebration of life and the, that uh, amazing passing of energy that you see only twice in your life. And one is when you're born and one is when you die. And to be 
in the presence of that transfer of energy is quite a privilege, and so we're careful to celebrate that. And of course, um, you know, we spend an, an enormous amount of time, you know, with the animals, and so it's a little bit at, at times like losing a family member, um, even though we perhaps um, the zebras at the, in that particular film, you know, aren't the key subject. But we've been filming zebras during the day, and we and we've watched them give birth, and then all of a sudden at night time, a hyena, you know, killed a zebra, and I think that's the only way to treat it is with an immense amount of respect. Um, and by doing that, we don't sensationalize um, any of these kills either in our films. I think that is important because that's when I think um, we are not being humanely fair to animals because the rest of the world starts thinking that it's their playground. And I don't think that is right. And indeed, you know, if you get a, a sort of snuff film of one kill after the other, after the other, after the other, uh, again, you desensitize the audience to the importance right, of this. Right, yeah. And also you, you start projecting two things. One is fear. So everybody then says, wow, these lions and, and leopards are, are terribly fearsome. But they only kill every couple of days. So they've got lives in between those. And then the other thing is that uh, we start, as you say, viewing them as our entertainment. So everybody then goes out into the bush on safari and says, I want to see a kill because it's like a sports event. And I think we've got to be careful about that. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, let's talk a little bit about your setup. You guys, um, I think we've all seen you out uh, being filmed out in um, the bush, driving around in your truck. Is that a daily um, occurrence for you guys? You head out in the truck, are you always in the truck? Do you ever leave the truck and move away? How did, what kind of setup do you yeah, have? So Jake, it depends on, on the project. So I'd say 80% of the time we're out pre-dawn, driving out, driving across the river, getting out into the right place where we think that we could probably pick up the subject. Uh, and we work damned hard. So we're up at four in the morning, 4.30 we're out, and then we come back in the dark if we're not working at night. If we are working at night, we reverse that. So we go out at four in the afternoon, work through the night, and come back at 10 in the morning. But it's, it's largely vehicle-based, not for any safety reasons at all, but because in many African play, uh, reserves or wildlife areas, these animals are much more used to vehicles than they are to upright walking man. And in fact, we've been hunting them for three and a half million years. So they've developed this, this resistance and fear of upright walking man. And so our whole lives and our methodology is to try and de-stress these moments so that if it's a vehicle that's parked there, we can get in relatively close, not too close. We don't get out the ground and crawl up to them and stick, stick GoPros in their noses and that sort of thing because that just increases the stress of the animal. And our ambition is to be there consistently long enough that these animals stop even looking at us and then we can get natural behavior. And then we have a film in the festival right now called Soul of the Elephant. And of course that actually uh, broke the routine of you know living out of a vehicle. Um, we did a lot of walking. It was a lot of the time through water, uh, especially when the water got too shallow for us to push our canoe. And we actually lived out of the canoe um, for weeks at a time because we were going from one point where the Okavango was feeding this particular spillway, which is called the Cylinder Spillway. And we did that uh, spillway a few times because we were looking at elephants and the behavior of elephants in a different way. We wanted to celebrate elephants. We wanted to be able to stop the ivory crisis, you know, happening um, in Asia, uh, but, but for people to say, wait a minute, they do have a heart, they're incredibly intelligent, so we were celebrating them all the way, and living out of the canoe, I mean, I got to the end of the trip, and I remember Derek saying, so, how did you feel? I said, I don't want this to ever stop. It was blissful, it was magical, and incredibly exciting, because as you can imagine, a, can a little canoe in the water with the elephants crossing from side to side, and, and some of them um, saw us as, as you know, sort of fear and a threat, and they either charged or ran away. But as we got closer and closer to the areas where they weren't being harmed, so out of poachers' way, um, sometimes we were just invisible. 
Yeah, that's incredible. Now, obviously, in situations like that, and, and many of the filming situations you've been in, you must have had issues one way or another, whether it's dangerous animals, and I don't mean that as, you know, just the fact that you're out there in the middle of wild animals, um, and also equipment. I mean, we can, have, we can be filming in a studio and equipment goes wrong. What kind of trials and tribulations have you had in your over 30 year careers um, throughout your filmmaking lives? Well, let's just deal with the animal interactions. And, and given the amount of time we've spent out there, we've had relatively few. So over 30 years, you just count up those hours and you'd expect there to be pages and pages of interactions that have been negative. Um, but having said that, we, I've, been, I've, been, I've had four bouts of malaria, I've had 20 scorpion stings, I've been bitten by deadly snakes that didn't turn out to be as deadly as their reputation three times. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. I crashed you know, three aeroplanes, um, been, we've been hit in the vehicle by, by elephants four times, and more recently by a buffalo that put Beverly in hospital for couple of months and uh, so that we've been out of action for six months as a result of that but um, there's always something going wrong so we're you know the cameras are breaking down batteries are failing at the wrong absolutely wrong time we drown a vehicle we we lose equipment it's a uh, you know we don't insure ourselves because I can't bear having the conversation with an insurer saying has anything ever gone wrong <laughs> <laughs> but I think what is important to say, you know, um, we've always felt that we have to have the utmost respect for the animal. Um, we really don't want to antagonize them or threaten them in any way. So we don't want to box them in so that they have to, you know, come out. Each and every incident that Derek has spoken about has been a little bit of a um, accident in many ways because it's either been in the dark, we've parked in an area, um, and actually we had been filming uh, lions and they had killed and so we just moved away from them to just uh, catch some sleep at around about 2 o'clock in the, in the morning. And um, this elephant had given birth behind a bush, which we obviously didn't see and didn't know. And she stood up, and her tiny little newborn came to the vehicle. And she was irate. And she started kicking sand at us, and we lifted our heads to see what was kicking sand at us. And it was, a, you know, it was this female cow. And so she hit us. And, but at least we handled it in a way that also was respectful to her. Uh, we didn't try and throw things at her or anything like that. Dirk just shone uh, the torch in her eyes, and she didn't like that, and she turned. And that gave us a chance, you know, to be able to get away from her, start the vehicle, drive towards where she had run, the little baby that wouldn't leave us followed and then we swerved and they're united again and so I think it is important for any future filmmaker is to have that utmost respect um, accidents will happen but when the accidents happen try and be responsible so that um, the animal doesn't get harmed I think also it was some of the major threats that we've had and uh, have been from poachers um, and we've got notes every now and again saying we know where we live and we'll come and get you and also from the hunting fraternity so we've been um, uh, fairly anti-hunting for a long time and increasingly so as as these numbers disappear and you know for instance there are maybe 20,000 lions and of those maybe three and a half thousand male lions but we still allow universally the shooting of 660 male lions a year, and so that's not sustainable. So we've been talking out about that, and some of those plane crashes I was talking about were a result of direct sabotage, and they've fired rounds of ammunition into our camp, and so it's, it's ironic that through all of this, our, our biggest threat is really our fellow man. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that I, I love about you guys as filmmakers is your utmost respect for wildlife and the fact that throughout the years you you still make the same kind of very respectful uh, wildlife shows and you know the, the industry has changed a lot. There's a lot of different type of programming when it comes to wildlife and, you know, channels like to kind of push people to break envelopes and, you know, show different things. And I think it's so wonderful that, you know, you guys are out there and you, you stick to your guns and you respect the wildlife and you're out there all the time doing what you love. And I think that's a, such an important lesson for any new filmmaker to take on board. Absolutely. Um, you know, just uh, talking about um, this last incident that just happened, um, when I was on the ground for 11 hours in the Okavango and, and uh, you know, Derek couldn't get me out until the morning, and um, somebody that came to help Derek said, we better get that buffalo shot. And 
I had just been hit by the buff- buffalo, mauled by the buffalo. And my first words were, don't harm that buffalo. And then when I was in ICU and um, Derek was dealing with everybody and he made it very clear to the camp, do not harm the buffalo. They got vets in to relocate it, but not to harm it. Because it's not its fault, right? Absolutely. I mean, we've totally forgiven um, the buffalo for that. Sadly, the buffalo did die because he was incredibly wounded. Um, he was living on a quarter lung. His one lung had collapsed and the other one was, ga- was gangrene. And so it wasn't his fault. He was demented. It was a freak accident in every way. I think if I was going to advise aspiring filmmakers, a young guy starting out, I would uh, I would say look at, at people uh, at, like us in, in this phase of our lives and consider your, p- place yourself there and then look back at your your career's work and how proud you will be of that or not. So make decisions now that you'll be able to look back at 30 years from now with a clear conscience. You know, I, that was going to be my last question to you was, you know, another piece of advice. And I think that sums it up beautifully. So um, I know you have to shoot to another meeting now. So thank you so much for coming and spending the time. Um, you know, it's an honor for me to sit and talk to you guys. And I'm so glad that you're both healthy and here today. Um, so again, thank you so much. Jake, thank you. Thank you, Jake. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series. You can find out more information on wildlife filmmaking at masterwildlifefilmmaking.com, where you'll find valuable free resources like downloadable reports and video tutorials. Thanks for listening.